Uh, an enjoyable evening thus far. A very, very large crowd again. Looks like we've got about maybe 120, 130 people here this evening, which uh, for a, an event in the middle of, a, of the summer has been uh, quite an eye-opener for us, quite a shocker. So it's a great turnout, a uh, great networking opportunity as well as always at a Wharton event. So uh, thank you very much for coming to the event this evening. Um, just a few, uh, few short comments from myself, because we are a little bit behind uh, my sort of scheduled time anyway. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, the University of Miami uh, for hosting this event for us. They're always a fantastic partner with the, the Wharton Club of South Florida. We have uh, several events here now with them. And they have fantastic facilities, a fantastic team. And there's a young lady right at the back of the room there. She hates me doing this. But uh, Jennifer Quintana at the back there, wonderful lady to work with. Just makes it so, so easy for the Wharton Club to hold events here. So Jennifer, thank you very much for all your help as usual. You're fantastic. Um, the next event that we're going to have at the Wharton Club, uh, we normally don't have events in the summer. Um, this is one in particular because uh, Ellie was coming down especially and uh, generously offered to come in and uh, work at the club and put an event on. So at the next event we have, we're going to be having the uh, Entrepreneur of the Year event on, uh, I think it's September 20th or 21st, about the third week of September. And we're going to be honoring uh, Terry Styles of Styles Development, the, the large sort of real estate developer up in Broward and sort of throughout South Florida. So we're very, very honored to have Terry uh, accepting our award that evening. Uh, I'd just like to thank, obviously, all the panelists. I'm going to turn over to Scott Koch in a moment. Uh, but we had a fantastic event last year, uh, which we've been able to sort of reproduce for the most part in its entirety. Jacques Hart is back from Raw Media. Alex is here. Uh, Jay Berkowitz and Scott. Uh, it's a great event. Uh, we do want to try and, you know, last year, one of the successes of last year's event was the fact that the, the audience Q&A. We sort of pushed it out there as quickly as possible, got the audience uh, in, in, involved in the discussion as early as possible, and that's what really what drove the event. So, uh, same thing tonight. It, you know, as soon as we do the introductions, you know, raise your hands, let's get involved in the Q&A, and so that you, you, you guys drive the discussion. That's what we want to cover. We want to answer your questions. There's going to be microphones on each side of the room uh, when we go into the Q&A. Just raise your hand, and there'll be a young lady on this side, and uh, either myself or a young gentleman on the other side. Just raise your hand. We'll pass you the mic, and you can ask your question. Um, again, uh, another thanks just to Jolie Hart here. Uh, Jolie is uh, Jacques's wife and uh, partner at Raw Media. There. Jolie's uh, generously offered to take all the photographs for us this evening in addition to uh, the UM photographer, so we greatly appreciate that. And finally, just a couple of small housekeeping tips before we do uh, jump into the program. If you have a cell phone or anything that's going to make a noise this evening, uh, please put it on vibrate or just uh, switch it off for the duration of the event. Um, Name badges, uh, we do like to recycle. We're very, we try to be green here at the Wharton Club of South Florida. Uh, when you do leave, there's going to be a table set up outside. If you can just drop your name badge on there so we can use it at a future event and uh, save the club both uh, a little bit of money as well and obviously save the environment. And on the Q&A, uh, we've obviously got quite a large crowd here this evening. There's going to be a lot of questions. So if you can do, keep your sort of questions. If you can do, keep them short, keep them succinct and to the point, and then we'll be able to move on to the next question here. That's what really what's going to drive the event tonight is, is the questions from yourself. So keep them short and succinct. And last but not least, if you're a member of the Wharton Club, you know, for all the members who are here this evening from the Wharton Club of South Florida, if you know any alumni who uh, sort of live down here in South Florida and they're not members of the club, you know, do the club a great favor and, and give that alumni a call and tell them what they're missing out on. I mean, you know, the club works incredibly hard. Uh, we have some fantastic events. We had 12 events last year, which attracted over 1,200 people. We averaged just over 106 people at our events last year, the 12 events. Uh, we're doing a hell of a lot of work with a lot of good events, a lot of great speakers, but really the lifeblood of the club is the membership. It's the Wharton alumni in the area. Uh, we have a great penetration rate. We're very successful in the amount of uh, Wharton alumni who are involved in the club, but we can always do more. So if you know any fellow alumni down here in South Florida who aren't members of the club, pick up the phone and give them a call, tell them what they're missing, and you know, encourage them to sign up as a member. Okay? Well, thank you very much, everyone, this evening. I'm going to pass it over to my... Uh, very able-bodied assistant here, Scott Koch, who will be a fantastic job of the moderation. And please enjoy the evening, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Bye-bye. So how's everyone doing tonight? Okay, we're going to have fun. We're going to go through, and we're each going to describe our background so you have a little bit of context. 
and then Ellie and Jay have a short presentations, um, which are going to be fabulous. And then we'll open up to Q&A, like David's saying. So uh, to get it started, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm an active angel investor, which isn't really a job description, more of a state of mind, I think. Um, and uh, that ranges from software to hardware to clean tech. Um, I'm a Wharton grad, um, class of 98. And uh, what I thought I'd do is uh, talk about a couple of my portfolio companies that are germane to the topic tonight, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on to Jay. So the first company I want to talk to you about is called Crowd Savvy. And this uh, company actually just launched last week in Chicago at uh, Tech Week, which is a four-day conference there. It was a lot of fun. Um, what it is, and I'll first uh, explain the nerd version of it. So it's a uh, embedded mobile SDK feedback platform with powerful analytics. Um, now, what that really means is what we do for mobile app publishers is they typically use uh, products like Flurry, which is akin to web analytics, like Google Analytics in the, uh, uh, the web world, to try to understand customer behavior. So, you know, where you're clicking on a website, tells you a lot of information um, about what's going on on your site. Uh, but what I like to say is that is sort of like watching a silent movie. And what we're trying to do is add the voice of the customer. Um, so to give you a couple examples, um, we've got, uh, like I said, it just launched. But beta customers, we had one customer that focused on new features and asking their, cust you know, their customer base basically about what they would like to see added uh, to their mobile app. So. Basically, what they found was, as opposed to sitting around a conference room table and sort of arguing about, you know, what I think the new feature should be or what someone else thinks the new feature should be, um, they're actually crowdsourcing that information um, and being able not only to get ideas, but to see how many people, you know, support this idea of a feature versus another feature. Um, so that was a big win for them. Uh, we've had another client in beta that had an advertiser come to them and ask them, uh, you know, how many of your users are women? They didn't have a clue. They had no way of answering that question, uh, which is pretty typical for uh, a mobile app, is they don't really know who you are. Uh, Apple may know who you are. Uh, Google may know who you are, but the app doesn't really know. Um, so now they're able to ask those sorts of questions so that not only they could go back to that advertiser and, and give them a percentage uh, that should be fairly accurate, uh, but they can now triangulate all of their various customer analytics against demographics. So a, another very big win for them. Uh, another uh, company uh, that I'm an a investor and advisor to is called Root Happy. Uh, and I like this one because it's actually uh, a fellow Wharton grad and classmate of mine uh, who it's his, his idea. He's spent pretty much his whole career in online travel, running, you know, $100, $200 million divisions of, uh, you know, within Travelocity. Um, and so his idea is that there's actually a lot of differentiation in air travel um, that none of us have a clue, uh, you know, on a route from Miami to LA, Philadelphia to Miami, what, what I should take. Everything is sort of built in the industry around price and route, you know, just the schedule, and that's all you do. And then you get on one flight, it's a nicer plane, different flight, it isn't, and you have no way of, uh, you know, figuring out that sort of information. And so this site is about, uh, again, enabling the customers to rate uh, flights by route and then add UGC user-generated content reviews. Um, and so again, the simple way to explain this is it's the Yelp of air travel. Um, so uh, both these businesses are, are really focused on empowering the customer um, and then as a result, empowering the business to provide a better service. So anyway, that's my intro. Um, we're going to kick it over to Jay. And uh, you can either give your intro there or come on over here and then give your talk. Go for it. You want to do that? Do yeah. It all? We'll get you can it. go for it there, yeah. Hi, my name is Jay Berkowitz. And I have an internet marketing company called 10 Golden Rules and a book and a blog and a podcast all by the same name. Um, I just wanted to touch quickly on some of the social media analytics tools that we're using. And I thought it'd just be really good thought starters for the questions. Um, one of the really cool tools is called Radian 6. And Radian 6 allows you to monitor what's being said about your company in social media. 
And you can even monitor sentiments. You can monitor if people are saying nice things or not so nice things or, you know, moderate things. Um, everybody's fam familiar with Facebook and a Facebook profile, but the really cool thing about Facebook is Facebook advertising today. And th these ads are all about internet marketing. So the ads I'm seeing on my friend's profile are talking to me, like they're talking about the stuff I'm into. And the really cool thing about this Facebook marketing is you can actually create um, ads and you can target an audience. So in this campaign, we're targeting 5,700 people based on their likes. So this is getting very precise, but the Facebook monitoring tool, the analytics tool, can't monitor conversions. And so what you want to monitor in internet advertising is did people actually sign up for something on your website? Did they buy something if you're selling an e-commerce product? So what we're doing is we're incorporating Facebook advertising and Google Analytics. And we're creating a unique analytics code um, in, for each Facebook campaign. And now we're able to monitor if people do something at your website, like they sign up for a webinar, they sign up to come to this event, or they download and buy one of your products. So that's one of the coolest integrations of analytics in our business right now. Some other tools we play with, Compete.com is a really good competitive analysis tool to see what your competitors are up to. Um, I use a tool called SEO Quake, and this tells me how Google rates my website and other websites I'm going to look at. It tells me how many other sites link to my site, and it gives me the Alexa score, the, the ranking of websites across the internet. SEM Rush is a great tool. It tells me how many people are, how many search engine results we have on the search engines. Uh, SpyFu, this is one of my favorites. It can tell you how much your competitors are spending on Google pay-per-click advertising. S-P-Y-F-U, SpyFu. Um, Google Analytics, of course, you know, core to telling you how many people are coming to your site, where they're coming from, where they're leaving your site. Um, so those are just a few of the tools that we're playing with in analytics for internet marketing and social media. Thank you. I'm Alex DiCarvalho. I, um, I run a social network for doctors called VoxMed. It's a worldwide social network which allows doctors to speak to each other from around the world. I also teach social media here at the University of Miami. Uh, it's a full semester course um, at the School of Communication. And I also uh, just wrote a book uh, for McGraw-Hill on social media security. And finally, I run um, some, uh, I, I, I created and founded some local uh, clubs, uh, Social Media Club of South Florida, which is about 2,500 members. Our next meetup is August 9th. Um, so we have monthly meetups, about 100, 150 people, people each time about people who want to learn more about social media for professional reasons. Also the Startup Forum, which brings venture capitalists together with startups, and uh, we hold uh, regular uh, kind of competitions. Um, and I also run an annual bar camp, which is a kind of a tech unconference, uh, where anyone that, that attends can speak. So to this panel, I'll bring more of a social media uh, perspective on, on analytics. Excellent. My name is Jacques, and uh, I'm with Roar Media. Roar Media is an integrated marketing communications firm. Um, primarily, I would like to position us in the digital PR space, and uh, our cup of tea is really focused on earned media. So if you look at the media landscape nowadays, it's, it can really be chalked up into three different buckets. You've got earned media, owned media, and paid media. Um, so under the earned media umbrella, you've got things that like um, media relations and PR and media outreach. Uh, you're earning the right to have your voice heard in those um, media channels, if you, if you will. Uh, another couple of examples would be social media. You're earning the right to dialogue and converse and engage with consumers in a social media channel. Um, I would also argue that search engine results pages or, or SERPs, you know, your presence in the organic listings, is also an earned media function. Um, and so then if you also look at, you know, you've got paid media and owned media. Um, Paid media, very obvious. Owned media is the assets that a brand might own, their own website, um, their marketing collateral, that sort of thing. And so what we have found as a local integrated marketing communications firm, by virtue of our, our geography, most of our clientele happen to operate in the professional services environment. So they tend to be consultants, doctors, physicians, uh, strategists, financial services, and that sort of thing. So we're very much in the business of helping them migrate from a traditional media standpoint into a digital media standpoint. And um, I've actually been very active throughout my career in this. I've helped uh, 
move industries like the auto industry and the travel industry kicking and screaming into the digital divide. And um, so I've seen the challenges along the way. I also see great opportunities across the this, this sphere, um, particularly in the professional services space. And with, now with the advent of social media, we really do have an opportunity to elevate our profile and our thought leadership and our subject matter expertise in these environments. But um, I'm most excited about talking tonight how we kind of craft our campaigns and help our clients define who they are, what their messaging platform is. And we do that with a very analytical, um, you know, consumer analytics approach. Um, so I'm going to share with you some strategies and tactics that we're using in keyword analysis and that sort of thing in terms of helping our customers build their messaging platform and build their identity online. Thank you. Great. I have Musical slides. Chairs again. In everyone's chair. That's great. So um, I'm Ellie McDonald Fight. I'm the research director of the Wharton Customer Analytics Initiative. Um, I have a PhD in marketing from the University of Michigan, so I'm sort of a nerdy professor type. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the research centers at Wharton, Wharton has over 30 research centers. And well, what is a research center supposed to do? Um, we're really here to kind of take ownership of a space and get faculty really excited about doing research in this area, to get students excited about careers in this area, and then in events like this to reach out to the broader alumni community and the business community at large and really get people to understand that this is an important space. And I just, I just can't think of a better group of people to, um, you know, represent the kind of full spectrum of what's going on in the area of sort of digital media and um, customer analytics. So I, I kind of prepared a few slides just to, um, since I talk to people about customer analytics a lot, I thought I would explain to you why customer analytics and, and why now and, you know, why all the things that Jade shows you are, are really important. Um, um, but I'm going to back off and just give you a sort of gentle analogy to hang on to before I sort of throw all the tools at you. So I could get up here and kind of, you know, show you all sorts of ugly math and interesting technology, but I'd like to, I'd like to kind of step back for a moment. So I want to step back to a time where customers bought everything at a place like a general store. And if you look at the picture on the right, it's a little grainy, um, but that's a general store. And, and it's really characterized by a couple of interesting things. First of all, there's that counter there. Um, does anyone know when, when, people, when stores stopped having counters? When you could actually go on the shelf and pick up something yourself? It was in about the 20s, um, and it was the Piggly Wiggly store in the southeast. Um, but this store is a store where there's a counter, and in order to take anything off the shelf and look at it, you have to ask someone for help. So it's very interactive, and um, the person who owns the business, who's kind of planning the business there, he gets to interact with his customers every day. Like, you know, I don't like this fabric. It's too expensive. Or, um, you know, I can't afford that. Or, uh, you know, I'd really prefer blue. Um, all those kinds of comments are, are just kind of filtering in his head all day long. Very interactive environment. The other thing that these stores had that's kind of interesting is if you look at that picture on the left, um, the lower left-hand corner, they often had like a, a place for people to just hang out and chit-chat with each other. Um, so that's kind of strange. Why would they have that? Well, it was a great listening post, right? His customers are there gossiping about who has a job, who we might want to extend credit to, <laughs> who we might not want to extend credit to. And you better believe that a good general store owner back in the 1800s was taking all that rich information he was getting about his customers, tucking it into his head, and using it to make all kinds of business decisions how should I price things, what should I stock on the shelf, what business lines should I even be in, kind of all the same things that actually Scott was talking about. These app developers want the same kind of rich interaction with their customers. Um, this kind of disappeared. So um, in the 50s, we kind of went to um, a mode of shopping that sort of, you know, the, the, the big box store would be the, the kind of the penultimate or the ultimate version of this. Um, so it's a store that's like characterized by not very much interaction at all. And we kind of got used to this environment where we walk into a store, we don't talk to anyone who has anything to do with the store. Um, you know, the stock boys come at night to put the stuff on the shelves because God forbid we should have a conversation about, with each other about what products we like. Um, and where are the marketers, the people who are making decisions about advertising? They're in some building in another city in the marketing headquarters because we have a huge 
huge national chain. Um, and this was largely spurred by the rise of mass media. Um, because mass media is expensive, so you, if you want to leverage mass media, you need this real efficient, um, you know, you use the mass media to, effic to efficiently communicate en masse with people, and then you have the big box store to kind of efficiently, you know, leverage that advertising and, and collect all the sales. Um, so how did we find out what our customers want in this world? Well, we invented a whole discipline, a discipline that I'm proud to be a part of, called marketing research. So about this time when we took away the interaction between the person who owned the store and the customer, um, we had to kind of create a whole industry of intermediaries whose job it was to go ask the customers, hey, how do you like the fabric? What color do you like? What price should it be? All those kinds of questions. We did it in kind of a pseudo-scientific way with the nice man and a clipboard who wouldn't even like tell you what company he was working for. And then there was a whole army of people like me, that's me in the lower right hand corner. Um, I was the analyst who would go back to the business decision makers and tell them what their customers think. So now we have this you know, horrible whisper down the lane problem that's going on. And like I said, I was a proud part of this industry. Um, but I have you know, made the decision with my career to actually just get out of survey research entirely. And let me show you the reason why. One day I looked at my Amazon homepage um, and Boy, this is very interesting, right? So um, those of you who look at it will quickly figure out that I'm a knitter. So there's a couple of knitting and crochet books on there. But I swear to you, I am the only person on the planet that also has an economics book. And if you scroll down, you get into all the really nerdy um, statistical textbooks that I'm into. And all of that um, you know, is there on my homepage. Um, but then I kind of thought about this for a minute. And I was like, you know what? We're back to the general store. This is a very interactive marketing environment, right? So when I want to look at a book at Amazon, I have to ask Amazon to show me the book. And they have a record that they showed me that book and whether or not I bought it. And it's all there just for the, ask, you know, just for the taking. And you know, as, a, as a big company, Amazon is phenomenal at sort of taking every interaction they have with me and leveraging that information to um, to uh, make their next marketing action towards me. So, you know, they're, they're not recommending to me the best sellers because they know I don't buy best sellers. They're recommending to me the, the nerdy statistics books and the crocheting books. Um, and I know a lot of you aren't working for, you know, big dot com companies, um, but you can carry that sort of general store analogy with you. So every time that you have an interaction with your customers, you really should be thinking about, you know, what's the opportunity to take the information that I get from this interaction that I'm having with my customer and leverage it to make a better business decision in some way. So let's get concrete. What am I talking about? There's all kinds of new data that you might have access to. So one would be media usage. There's much richer information about what people are watching on television because they're watching it like on YouTube or Google TV or even Comcast has really rich information about what individual people are watching. Um, all kinds of information about the relationships and networks, you know, uh, it's pretty easy to figure out who people's friends are, to target the friends of people who are uh, interested in one thing or another. Um, social media and other generic UGC, so all the things people are posting on your Facebook page, that's information, right? If you have a Facebook page for your business and people are posting, you know, that's useful information and how can we leverage it? Um, advertising and direct marketing exposures are much more accurately tracked now, so it's pretty easy online to tell who's seen which ad. Um, search engine usage is also fairly easy to track. Um, web store browsing, retail shopping, it goes on and on and on. Um, and I've kind of organized them a little bit for you, but in the course of living and shopping and buying and using the product, um, we have a lot more chances to see what our customers are doing and how they're enjoying the product or service. Um, and I'd like to sort of, you know, as collectively as a group tonight, we should think about ways to use that that new information to make the same old decisions we're always making. So, you know, remember your intro marketing class? What are the decisions that marketers make? Does anyone remember them? Do you guys remember them? Four Ps. The four Ps? <laughs> anyone remember the four Ps? Who remembers the four Ps? Yeah, so we have just the same old decisions, advertising and promotion, product, distribution, pricing, <laughs> and I add forecasting and operational planning because I used to 
be someone who planned factories, and it's, that's important too. So we'll, we'll put that on the list. Um, so that's my, my call to action for tonight. I think we'll leave it at that and start the questions. Okay, great. So what we're going to do to kick off is I'm just going to ask a question that uh, all the panelists can have a chance to answer. And then once we're through with that, I'd love to throw it out to the audience and start getting some questions from you. So the first question is, can each of you give a real world example of how customer analytics are being used for competitive advantage today? Now that could be a client example or your own business, whatever it is, just something tangible to, uh, to share. You want to start, Jay? Sure. Well, I showed you. Is this on? I showed you an example of a tool we use called SpyFu, and I love this tool because I can see what my clients' competitors are doing on Google pay-per-click advertising. So it shows me how much money they're spending. It shows it tracks it over years, so I can, I can see seasonality. It shows me what keywords they're bidding on, how much they're bidding, and here's a really valuable part. I can also see what landing pages they're testing. So when you just go in and you look, you know, you search for something in, in your industry and you click on an ad, you can't see the enormity of the campaign and all the different offers they're testing. But this shows you landing pages. So a landing page is a specific page on a website different from a home page. So you can see they're testing four or five different offers. So it allows you to really look into your competitors' campaigns and you can reverse engineer those campaigns and you can say, look, they keep advertising against this keyword and they're using this landing page all the time. It must be working for them. And so then you can go and reverse engineer that campaign and use it for your competitive advantage. I'd say from the uh, social media side, um, companies like Dell and Gatorade are using uh, social media monitoring to just do exactly what that store owner was doing to understand what people are talking about, what the buzz is, uh, understand where the uh, flaws in the product are. Uh, they've built control rooms, and these control rooms have like big screens, and they're tracking, you know, what's being said on Twitter and different things. They're using tools like Radiant Six uh, to understand and to see the graphs and to see the sentiment around mentions uh, of their brand and and related uh, words uh, to their brand. So I think that's giving them insights. I'm going to uh, steal some of Jay's thunder, actually. I think one of the big takeaways this evening needs to be that these tools exist out there, and they're widely accessible to all of us. And so Radian 6 is a great example. Radian 6 happens to be subscri subscription-based. It happens to be quite expensive, so it's not for the everyday user. It's more for an agency like ourselves. However, there are a lot of open source tools out there that we can kind of mission mash and used to serve our own interests. And so I'll walk you guys through a quick mini case study, if you will. Uh, one of our clients is a hotel client. And uh, believe it or not, they were losing money online as it related to their uh, AdWords or their, their CPC advertising budget. Sounds crazy. They're, they're part of a, a larger conglomerate. And everyone from corporate was saying, you have to invest into paid advertising, you know, paid cloth cost per click or paid search advertising. And they said, well, we've been doing it for two years and we're just losing money on it. We're not seeing the ROI there. And so we took a deep dive into their business and believe it or not, in a lot of cases, we found ourselves using these open source analytical tools. And so, and they're available to all of us and I'm gonna be rattling off some names uh, that might be useful to you folks in the future, but um, very simple. Just Google the word keywords and you're gonna find Google has a keyword analytic tool that actually is very sophisticated and probably one of the most accurate in the marketplaces because Google is Google and it's tracking itself. Um, having said that though, there was some really valuable lessons from that. We actually mashed that data with their, their Google Analytics data and, and then also looked at their TripAdvisor feedback and we noticed that a large majority of their new customers were coming from Brazil. And so, no big surprise, right? Brazil's on fire right now. There's a lot of interest in South Florida. And so, uh, we decided, you know, very smartly that why compete for the words like Miami Luxury Hotel that everyone else is competing for and paying $10 cost per click? Why not focus on what I call cherry picking or bottom feeding? And so, you know, we were able to identify Brazil as a target market because of these open source analytical tools 
and then put together, as Jay mentioned, a very simple campaign. It's not rocket science. You're, you're developing a keyword set in Portuguese, you're developing a landing page in Portuguese, and you're driving consumers down. And believe it or not, when they turn this on, they've seen a 20 to 1 return on investment. It's because they're using analytics to differentiate themselves and play in a space that doesn't have the same level of competition. So I think uh, cherry picking is a very valuable takeaway if we can take a deep dive into the analytics. I just want to kind of build on that to say a lot of times, you know, you, the original question was where are companies sort of gaining real competitive advantage? Um, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, they might have been doing, you know, other types of marketing that they couldn't monitor so closely. So just the fact that they know what the lift was when they turned this system on is just remarkable. And there's just these huge opportunities to, you know, just follow the rule of thumb. If you can't measure it, don't do it. Because there's so many things you can do that are measurable and you'll know it worked or it didn't work or, you know, th there's just huge opportunities. And they don't, you know, you don't always need the fancy tools. The fancy tools are only needed when the data gets really big. So if you're a smaller business, you know, read your Facebook page postings. Like, it could be as simple as that. You don't need a sentiment analysis tool when there's like five or six of them a day. You could just read them and use your own God-given sentiment analysis <laughs> tool, which actually, on the technical side, is, is a lot more, um, a lot better, a more effective than some of the, some of the commercial sentiment analysis tools are a little, little bit iffy. So I'll give, I'm going to give an example. I've already you know, given a couple examples of portfolio companies, but I was at uh, Tech Week in Chicago last week for Crowd Savvy, and you know, you're shaking hands with a lot of people that are all starting very interesting companies. And this one guy asked, what do you do? And he says, I've been sucking on the Twitter pipe for 450 days. Okay, that was unexpected. I wasn't sure exactly what that meant. Um, but apparently, I was supposed to understand what it meant, so he, he had to explain it to me. The API. <laughs> exactly. Um, so um, sites, uh, sites like Twitter or services like Share This, um, as opposed to a uh, site like Facebook, which is a very closed network, actually license their data sets. So what this guy was saying was basically, he is seeing in real time every single tweet in the world. And what he's doing is he's trying to uh, analyze keywords um, as well as understand the associations between people. So who you're following and who's following you and then what you're tweeting about to try to understand what type of a person you are, what you're interested in. Um, and then he is selling that data to companies that are trying to figure out how to advertise to you. So Amazon's already built their interest graph based on their own data of what you've bought. But for uh, you know, American Express trying to decide who should they serve up in some banner ad uh, a black card to, they go to a company like this that says, well, the things you're tweeting about seem to indicate that you may have a lot of money. Seems like a lot of your friends are the same way. We're going to serve you that ad. Um, kind of a far out example. But anyway, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, so let's get started. Sorry? I'm going to have to look that up. I'm not sure. If you can define it in a, in a more, in, in, in a way that would include not just those, if it's, if it's way beyond what those are. And the second thing is, how do you address the marketing needs, or, or, or how would you market to the baby boomers, who there's about 75 million, who, as you know, have now begun to hit 65 years of age, supposedly have incredible wealth, and are going to be buying and will be buying a lot of things. 
if they don't necessarily participate in Facebook and Twitter and many of these so-called social media. So define it and then tell me how you'd market to the uh, baby boomers. Alex, you want to take that? All right, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So um, to me, but also on Wikipedia, social media is, is defined. So Wikipedia is social media and people have contributed to Wikimedia, to Wikipedia to define social media. So it's kind of a crowdsourced definition of social media, which probably is, is pretty good, right? So they define it as three things. It's, it's three things that are related. It's like a Venn diagram, you know, three bubbles together. One is the platforms that allow sharing. Number two is the act of sharing, the relationships and the conversations. And number three, perhaps most important, is the result of that. What is the, what is the uh, social construct that comes from that? What is the viewpoint? What is the, uh, you know, what is the result of all that sharing? You know, what do people think? So it's the platforms, the act of sharing, and the result of that sharing. That would be social media. That's one definition. I had a question on market research. Um, in the old days, statisticians were always aware of certain biases that were built into the process, whether it's uh, age bias or how you ask the question. I'm curious, in the digital analytics, what type of biases have been identified, um, especially where it translates from the digital domain to trying to translate that kind of information towards brick and mortar or when you're bringing them into uh, your stores? Or so, uh, sure. that kind of so if in a pure digital, it's beautiful in a pure digital world, right? If you're a StubHub that sells tickets, you actually have great detailed data on every single one of your customers because they're not crossing that digital divide. They're, they're all there and you get a complete census. So in that case, it's actually better than the old days because in the old days, I like sampled a bunch of people in the mall and the people in the mall aren't necessarily representative of I mean, this problem has been around a long time and a lot of market researchers had been sweeping it under the rug too. Um, in the online, offline world, you know, there, there's a lot of things you can do on the technical side, but it, it, is, it remains a fundamental problem. If you're dealing with a group of people that's just not online, they're, they're always, the risk will always be there that they're going to behave a little bit differently. But the, the good news is that problem will go away in 20 years. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry, who's got the mic? I do over here. Okay, go for it. Um, the, the kind of analytics you're talking about are, are really awesome, and I think you know, it's, it's exciting. You know, if you're Carnival Cruise Lines, I can see the utility is just amazing. Uh, what if you're an accounting firm with uh, 15 accountants or a machine shop in Hialeah that makes pipe fittings? Um, when does social media and the utilization of these analytics become a low priority or a non-priority in the context of your overall marketing approach? Ooh. <laughs> um, I only raise my hand, right, because the answer is never. Um, but I think there are a lot of open source analytical tools now for professional services firms. Um, we all see on our HD television screens, Angie'sList.com. They're doing a million dollar national campaign right now. Um, we, we're all aware of Yelp.com, um, TripAdvisor in the hotel industry. I think we're going to see a huge proliferation of these sites that really drill down on verticals. Uh, we're seeing it. Fine Law uh, has a big you know, site dedicated to the legal profession. So does LexisNexis, wh whereby it's open source and site visitors can actually come there, leave their feedback, leave star ratings, that sort of thing. So for good or bad, as professionals, we're being diminished <coughs> down to little stars. But I think those little stars are actually going to have a big impact on our ability to, to sell in the future. Um, and what's really interesting about those, if you go to TripAdvisor, for example, and we're starting to see this across the entire spectrum, they're now starting to rank you and make that information public across the spectrum of your entire competitive set. So, um, you know, hotels now are not just looking at their own individual reviews and rating systems, but you're able to then compare that against your competitive set. And that'll happen in the legal profession, it'll happen in all the professional services professions. Um, so I think there are some incredible analytics that we can actually receive out of those. You know, how many, what's the percentage of your uh, quality score that's excellent versus, you know, very negative? Um, 
how do you stack up against your competitive set? So I think in the future that's only going to become more and more important and maybe even more and more of a mystery to a plumber or you know a gas station or whatever the case might be, but uh, that's where the market's going. Uh, let me give a couple examples. I mean, I'll, I'll use your example of the accounting firm, okay? So, I mean, what's amazing about the digital media is it actually is empowering for the small business. So for the accounting firm, um, you know, start a blog, right? SEO your site. If you start providing all sorts of information out there that people start following your blog, you're going to start getting clients that would never have met you. You're going to get clients out of market, okay? So there's a lot of ways that a small business, particularly a service provider, can use the internet um, in ways that, you know, didn't exist before. Um, to take a, uh, an example of retail, right? So take your, your uh, you know, your corner coffee shop. How do you compete against Starbucks? You know, like Ellie, Ellie was saying, it's like when we went to big box, big companies, it was all about being uh, able to uh, target huge markets with mass media, right? So Starbucks has that advantage. They're on TV. They're in all sorts of advertising. And you as, you know, Bob's corner coffee shop can't do that, right? Um, but look at, uh, you know, uh, services like Yelp, right? That democratizes things tremendously. Um, you look at any type of mobile advertising that focuses on a local uh, demographic, right? So you can actually target very locally when your ad would be served. So there's all sorts of ways um, that all of the stuff we're talking about isn't just for American Express and Carnival Cruise Lines. It's really for small businesses. Uh, but I mean, it still requires a lot of education to learn new technology to get there. But, so I, I live in a little town and the, the corner bar, you know, if you think about 10 years ago, how did the corner bar, how could they reach out to their customers and get people to come in more often? Advertise in the weekly, uh, put a sign out on the street, and now they have a Facebook page and they just put their specials on three times a week. It's gotten me like at least a couple times a month. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, that's great. I like that drink. I'm going to go check it out. I mean, another example would be uh, Groupon and Living Social and all the new competitors that are going to be targeting uh, doing the same thing now. at and is coming out with a service around Yellow Pages. Um, there you have the ability to very target, you know, target in your local market, provide a big discount coupon, gets pushed out through email in the local market, and suddenly you get a flash mob of customers. Now, there are some issues as to whether I actually want that um, as a business, but there's all sorts of businesses out there um, dealing with social and mobile and, and uh, advertising that are targeting the small and medium business customer now. I have a question about cookies in, in, in the back here. Sorry, we don't have any cookies here tonight. <laughs> no, do, do when users delete their cookies and their cache on a regular basis, is that, uh, re is that reflected in analytics? Does it affect the analytics? That, that's a good question. I actually uh, saw a presentation last week from uh, the co-founder and chairman of Comscore talking about how a lot of the data from that they, that they get through those cookies uh, is actually pretty false. So, um, uh, although, you know, I would certainly recommend to delete your cookies on a regular basis, um, you know, the, what's, what's coming out more and more now is that that's not actually often the analytics that they perform against that data isn't very accurate. So, take for example, um, you know, you've got a, a desktop PC in your house and two of your kids use it, you use it, your wife uses it. How are they figuring out your behavior? right, through the cookie, right? They don't really know who's who in that house. So it's, it's not as useful as, uh, for instance, mobile, where more than likely two people aren't sharing the same phone. But I, uh, bigger companies are actually also, um, to get away from cookies, like provide some reason for the user to log in. So, uh, you know, I talked to the guy who um, was at ESPN.com in the early days. And um, you know they have fantasy games on ESPN.com? They did that very intentionally. It wasn't, I mean, it was partially, yeah, we'll get more page views and we can sell more advertising, but it was also to get people to log in. You wanna see where your bracket is, right? And so 
they, they basically design the system where you want to log in from all of your devices because you want to see your bracket. And then now we can track your media usage over time. So you know, the initiative actually worked on understanding how people um, used uh, different platforms to view the World Cup, streaming video, online media, mobile. And the reason we were able to do that with ESPN was because they had this rich, detailed data because people, people log on to see their brackets. A couple other examples. My Amazon homepage, <coughs> I just got a new iPad and like I want to log in because I want to see my crochet books. <laughs> when I, you know, it's like I don't want the user experience without logging in. Or, or a Netflix has a sort of model where you want to be logged in because there's some some value for you. And if we sort of translate that down to the small business side, there could be like content that if you've given us our email, you can see that content. And that can help you kind of track users over time. It's kind of the best way to do is get them to tell you, yeah, it's me, watch me. So we have time for two more questions. And I keep pointing at you and you haven't had a mic, so it's your turn. I'd, I'd just like to, you know, there's, um, there's a point where, you know, if you're measuring what you're doing, like what you just said, if you don't measure it, don't do it. I, I completely disagree with that, violently disagree. Because, you know, social media is social. And like, how would you feel like if you're talking to a friend or, or someone you just met like tonight afterwards, we're gonna network, and they're looking at their watch every like, every 10 seconds. You're gonna think, my God, that guy's bored with what I'm saying. He wants to get out of here. And so if you're measuring what you're doing as you're doing it, that's gonna come through in your relationship, with, in your interactions with those people. And they're gonna be, well, this company is just, you know, they just wanna get rid of me, right? So there's a point where if you just completely focus on the measurement as you interact in social media, you're just shooting yourself in the foot and you're doing yourself more harm than not. So, of course, different companies do different things. So, you know, like PlayStation measure everything, but Southwest Airlines don't, and they're both very successful. Southwest has a very successful blog. You know, they have 20 contributors to the blog, to the blog from the mechanic to the pilot. They have so many readers, so many comments, and they're not measuring that stuff. They're just having fun. When they have a problem, they talk about it. When there's something awesome going on, they talk about it. And, you know, they don't care. They're not measuring that stuff. And, and that authenticity th shows through in, in everything they do. So that's my point about, you know, getting paranoid about analytics. <laughs> yeah. I had to get that in before the night's so over. some nice tools. Um, one I actually looked at recently, um, I, there's a tool called Clout, K-L-O-U-T, and my Clout score, I thought it was pretty good, it was like 55. Alex is like 68. And what Clout is measuring is um, how influential is this person based on how many people retweet what they say? How many, how influential are those people? Um, how likely is it that one of the big players like with a huge Twitter following or huge Facebook following is going to like or comment or retweet on something that the person said. So Alex is a lot, of, a lot more close. But um, 
Because he's not paying attention. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's just doing it. Maybe he's just sharing it, love, sharing the love. <laughs> and uh, another friend of mine is Iconic88, great person to follow out of um, uh, Sydney, Australia. And, and he just is the most positive person, everything, all day, positive, positive, positive. Shares the love. He started this thing called Random Acts of Kindness. And he's the second most retweeted person in the world. It's just everything's very, very positive. And from a business perspective, um, it's, uh, we're just starting to see it now. All these Facebook statistics are getting so valid because there's so much activity. But Facebook Insights is they're tracking, and we're starting to see like how many people are interacting with a page. And, and that's really the me a valid, valid measure, I think, of like how many people are liking things, how many people are commenting on things. And we're starting to see the charts really start to go up as we build these communities, and it's sure. exciting. <laughs> Final <laughs> question. <laughs> You know, um, I think there's a million different ways to skin the cat, and it obviously it applies to individual circumstances and situations. Um, so you really have to kind of size up what the task is at hand. What you know, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, and I think part of it is taking a real deep dive. You know, I, I don't. I, we sometimes might take you know all this technology for granted and that sort of thing, but you know there was human beings behind it that developed it to, be, to begin with and they probably think more similar to us than more dissimilar to us. And so as a result, you know, you have to get your hands dirty and you have to follow that process through from A to Z. Um, and there usually is, you know, some type of funnel along the way. Um, but, you know, going back to these, you know, our, our colleagues' points here, um, you have a quantitative analysis and you have a qualitative analysis. And I think that as it relates to social, we need to think more in terms of qualitative analysis. And we should all be keeping um, a little scorecard. And so, you know, just to check off the times that social media brought goodness to our organization or to our own personal lives. Um, because, you know, it, it happens in random acts of kindness, as you mentioned. All of a sudden, you know, you reconnected with a long lost college friend that you guys were both attorneys, and now he has a booming practice and he's not serving this individual practice area. Um, and he actually wants to farm that work out to you, and you reconnect it in LinkedIn. Um, and so it's those type of small wins that I think that we have to keep a list of because, you know, measuring it from a quantitative standpoint, it requires a lot of time, effort, um, resources, and it, it requires bringing in the professionals, right? Um, especially when you work in a business that's not peer e-commerce. If, if there's an offline component to it, you break that chain in the link, uh, and now you're talking about tracking walk-ups, you're talking about tracking phone-ups, that sort of thing, and that's a whole different measurement world, trying to link that back to the initial interest spurred online, and it can get so complex that you're gonna just walk away from it and say, let me go back to that little checklist and just start checking off the qualitative benefits here. So I don't know if that's, Helped answer something. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer in, a, an, in another way. Um, and I'll, I'll go back to the analogy I gave to watching a silent movie, because I think that's kind of what you're, you're talking about, is you're looking at those analytics, you're seeing the behaviors, but you don't know why. Exactly. So, okay, so the short answer is if you're dealing with a mobile app, please go out and get crowd savvy. Um, and and if, you're, uh, uh, if, if you're dealing with a website, Go look up something like get satisfaction, okay? 
the idea is you've got to start asking questions of your actual customers to go back to exactly what she's if, saying if about you were, if the you general were the store. General store owner, and someone stormed out of your store, wouldn't you say, "Why?" Wouldn't you just ask them? <laughs> like, right. Just ask so, them, I mean, and more and more you're going to have the opportunity to ask them right when it happens. Yeah. So I mean, we we will ask a question to introduce, uh, you know, something like the the uh, net promoter score question would you know would you recommend this to you know, this app whatever it is to a friend or colleague and then based on that answer we're not just trying to grade ourselves the way the NPS score is we then put you down diff a different funnel right so if you're if you answer no I wouldn't okay why what what don't you like what, and that's trying to address issues of churn you know I'm I'm actually getting some people to answer the question before I never see them again. So maybe I can, you know, do something about it. Maybe I can't do it for you, but I'll do it for the next guy, right? And then if there's stuff that you do like, it's a different set of, different set of answers. And, and then if you have, um, you know, specifically looking at those analytics, whether it's Google Analytics or Flurry or whatever, you know, you know people are keep leaving at this page or people, you know, keep going to this one thing and I don't know why. Okay, ask them, you know, find a way. And again, you know, there's, there's tools available to uh, you know, actually ask your question questions of customers. Right. And more and more, the opportunity is going to be there to do it right then, not with a separate group of customers from the mall or whatever. Exactly. Do it right when, right, right when they're engaged. That's what we're trying to do with crowd savvy. So it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I'll, I'll just wrap up because we probably shouldn't have talked the whole panel without mentioning Avinash Kaushik. And Avinash is Google's analytics evangelist, and he wrote a great book called Analytics: An Hour a Day. Highly recommend it. Also, his blog Occam, Occam's Razor. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic blog on analytics. Just Google Avinash, you'll find it. But what he says is. Analytics, and he, he's the analytics evangelist, he says, analytics tells us the what, but you need to know the why, exactly what you're asking. And so what he recommends is an exit survey, and I've executed a number of these for our clients, and he says he asked three questions. The first question is, why did you come to our website today? The second question is, what were you trying to accomplish? And the third question was, if not, why not? And it's amazing what this reveals, and people will tell you exactly what they were looking for, and exactly what they were and weren't able to accomplish. Fantastic. Great. David, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, I'd like to uh, just close out this evening, ladies and gentlemen, by uh, thanking, actually, uh, not only the panel and the moderator, but also the audience as well. Uh, just like last year's event, has been a fantastic partnership between everybody in the room. Great audience Q&A. Fantastic answers from, a, a, I would say, a wonderful panel, a wonderful panel. Um, what we will do, um, if it's okay with the, uh, some of the panelists who had presentations there, we will send out the PowerPoint presentations that they used this evening, two PowerPoint presentations. I'll ask uh, Jay and the other panelists as well if they'd, if they'd like to send the links and the names of the websites and the Twitter accounts to follow that we can compile and we'll send it out in an email over the next uh, couple of days so you'll have all the information there. And uh, really just, uh, again, a shameless plug for the Wharton Club uh, from a social media perspective. If you've enjoyed the, this evening's event, you know, put it out there on your, you know, send the tweet out, you know, like us on Facebook, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Uh, for the members in the club, we do have a LinkedIn group as well, but that's a members only LinkedIn group. You know, join that group as well and, you know, get the word out about the Wharton Club. You know, it, it takes, it's a lot of work putting these events on a lot of sacrifice from the club members and the panelists and the moderators and so on. And our reward really is so that people come into our events and enjoy them. So again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Give yourself a round of applause as well as the panelists as well and the moderator. Thank you.